Steve Bell, as you know, is a songwriter, storyteller, and uh, in his words, troubadour for our time on a focused mission for, as he describes, refreshing Christian faith and spiritual practice for the weary and the wary. Pilgrim Year, his new set of seven books and two companion CDs, which we are here to launch this evening, falls into that very tradition. Drawing on poetry, music, history, these volumes, through these volumes, Steve shepherds us through a prayerful journey through the Christian calendar year, through Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Holy Week, Easter, and Ordinary Time. My name is Arlen. I'm Director of Common Word, a National Anabaptist Bookstore and Resource Center uh, that is jointly operated by CMU and Mennonite Church Canada. Tonight's program will go largely unannounced. Steve has a set of songs. Christine Longhurst, music professor at CMU, will engage Steve in conversation. Uh, and Steve will, I believe, read some excerpts from his collection. We'll follow that up with the several door prizes. I hope most of you, all of you, have signed up. Please do so before the end of the program. And we'll make two draws for two um, uh, box sets of these books at the end of the program. After the program, the books and CDs are all available um, at Common Word and will be open until you, to, uh, as long as you're here. Please stick around for uh, a latte or something else from Folio and uh, chat among yourselves and mingle and talk with Steve afterwards. Welcome. Enjoy the evening. Thanks for coming. I'll just open up with two songs because I know how to do that. The rest I've never done before. So this is... Uh, this is my first book launch because I've never written books before in, of this kind. And so it just, I feel a little off, um, off kilter. Okay. Okay, this, there, there's a sing-along part, um, and that's really weird um, in this environment, but when I nod, you're going to know what to do. Love is our way to God, for God is love. So love is our way to God, for God is love. The wilderness road of shame is gone The desert road of dislocation gone The stony road of loneliness has now become A royal way, a highway home Love is our way to God, for God is love Nice Love is our way to God, for God is love. And all who carry disappointment come, and those who fear the fire of judgment come, and those who teach this royal way is not for some. Shame on you. Now lovers come, cause love is our way to God, for God is love. Love is our way to God, for God is love. Love is patient, love is kind. Love pays ill, no, never mind. Love refines the finest gold, the charity of saintly souls. A 
The only thing left for us to do is love If this alone be done, it is enough And as we love the other, God abides in us God unseen, but seen in love Love is our way to God, for God is love Love is our way to God, for God is love. Love is our way to God, for God is love. Love is our way to God, for God is love. Nice. Thank you. Hey, Dave, can you turn my vocal down a lot and then uh, turn my guitar off just for a second while I reset this, maybe? Okay, I think we're fine. Okay, um, before Christine comes up, I want to do a new song for you. And um, whenever you write a new song, um, you as a songwriter don't really, you can't really know if it's worthy. You have to kind of inflict it on people for a while and see what comes back at you. But this is, it's brand new, just a couple weeks well, since I finished it. And it was commissioned. A friend of mine wrote a children's book called, um, without, um, his name is Tim Hoff. And he and Iona Snare, another friend, wrote a children's book called Am I Safe? And it's um, a book helping kids to deal with anxiety, uh, which is kind of a pandemic thing that's happening right now in, in, in North America. It's a beautiful book. And, um, and so they asked if I could write a kind of a family lullaby um, that goes with it. And so we recorded it and, and put it out. So I, I wrote this with my daughter-in-law, Diana Pops. And uh, we had, um, it was a bit of a struggle because if you're going to write something consoling for kids, but you can't lie, <laughs> right? You can't tell them that th the, it, isn't, it is not a safe, that, or that it is a safe world, because it's not true, right? So what can you say? And, and all we could come up with in the end was um, this sort of this, this sense of that we can be with each other, we can be present to each other. And even if that's only in the heart, um, and that I can be with you in your heart, and you with me in my heart, and that's not just imagination, that can actually be true. Um, and so we, we, uh, we came up with this one, so I'll try it on you here. When you are lonely, confused, or afraid, think of me standing by you. I am no more than a heartbeat away, think of me standing by you. The heart is like a home Where you are not alone First light of morning and last light of day Think of me standing by you And when it's a struggle for you to be calm Think of me standing by you when you are worried that something's gone wrong, think of me standing by you. Love is like a home where you are not alone. So keep as a treasure the heart of this tune. Think of me standing by you. When you can't name that fear you feel, And still know that love is real too Sometimes your thoughts leave you weak and upset Think of me standing by you Pause for a moment to take a deep breath And think of me standing by you Your heart is always home To those you call Take heart and take courage and never forget To think of me standing by you Think of me standing by you
Thank you. The new song. Christine, come on up. Okay, so let me... Um, I've, I've never done a book launch before, so I don't really know if we're doing this right, um, but it's, I know most of you, so I'm thinking we're going to be fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and I thought rather than just sort of talk about the book and, and say things that nobody's interested in, might get somebody actually to think about what people might be interested in in interviews. So we've asked Christine. Oh, no pressure there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but let me just tell you about the book very, very quickly. It's a seven-volume uh, seven book um, of short reflections on the spirituality of the church calendar year. Um, and each chapter is sort of contained in itself. It's its, its own reflection. Um, you don't have to read sequentially. Um, you can sort of pop in any time you want, or you can read sequentially uh, if you'd like. And it's just a way of kind of going through the church count of the story, the grand narrative that, 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 it, um, that it tells. Um, and that's about enough. I think we could... Yeah, if you talk much more, I won't have any yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, there, there you go, okay. <laughs> just kidding. Could you give Christine a hand? I just <laughs> asked her last week if she would do this. Yeah. She interviewed you once before. It was such a fun time, so no pressure, but I yeah, ho hope it's good this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I sit down The now? book sales depend on you right now. <laughs> okay. By the way, that's a great song. Oh, the, thank your you. Your last one is, uh, thank you. I think it's a winner. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you know what? If you, want to, uh, if you go to um, CompassionSeries.com, so Tim has written several books uh, for children called the Compassion Series um, on different aspects, um, sort of arousing empathy in children. Um, so CompassionSeries.com, and you can see the book there. Uh, and then also you can hear the song and download it if you want. It's, it's there. So. Cool. Yep. Cool. All right. I got a whole bunch of pages. No, just kidding. Uh, first off, mm. congratulations. Uh, Thank you. This is a fine series. I've had a chance to read it all, and uh, it's, it's just really well done. Thank you. Uh, and now you can add published author to your long list of already <laughs> other wonderful things you've done. So uh, how does it feel to have it done? Was this a great relief? Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, writing is way harder than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I've talked to other writers, <laughs> and apparently I'm not alone on that. I suspect not. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I think it's the hardest, hardest work I've ever done because... Usually when, when you're working with a song, it's kind of a single contained unit and it's kind of done, but this had to sort of sustain attention for months. Yep. Was, I'm yep. not used to that, yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for oh. hours, I'm not used to it. So. <laughs> you know, most authors have to work really, really hard to find somebody willing to print their stuff. I mean, finding a publisher is hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not how this came about, though, right? Do you want to tell us a little bit about Novalis' uh, jumping in here? How yeah, that... okay. I, st I started this several years ago, and just I, I was writing blogs on, as I was sort of getting into the spiritual of the church calendar year and really finding some things I thought were worth talking about, mm -hmm. I started writing blogs. And then someone at one point said, you know, you could string these together and do books. Um, and then I, so we did it online, yeah. and I had guest authors, and it, it was a whole kind of a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it had some success, but we didn't really push it very hard. Um, and then around this time last year, Dave, my manager, and I decided, we started asking the question, would it suit a book form? form yeah. Um, and we didn't know. And so we put out some feelers in the community. Some of you did, um, we, we sort of did a, a mock version of the first book and put some copies out for people to read and ask them to respond. And we got really good responses. But yeah. suddenly we got this call from Toronto, from Novalis, which is um, the big Catholic um, book company in Canada. Yeah. And they said, would you let us publish it? And um, I said, like, do you know I'm not Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they seem to be just fine with that, you know? Yeah. And they, they, well, they said, actually, you're more Catholic than most of our authors, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that was funny. And, and what they liked about it was that I came, I, I came at it from, I didn't grow up in the tradition, and so I brought fresh eyes to it. Right. And so they, they, they thought that was a good thing. Yeah. And so then, yeah, and then they, um, we didn't even bargain with them. They just offered us something, a really, really lovely deal that was very workable. Wow. It was a win-win. They're really nice people. It just wasn't like you sometimes think of these bargaining things as being sort of hard and, and yeah. everybody, and it just wasn't that at all. They just said, why don't we do it this way? And Dave and I went, yeah. yeah. And then, and that was, a, that was only about six months ago. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I have to say, okay, I, I don't want to sound like a salesperson here because mm -hmm. I'm not getting commission, although... 
I probably should have you talked probably should about have raised that, that ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too uh, late now. It's a beautiful, it's a beautifully done series. Like mm. it feels, I don't know if you've had a chance to pick it up, but it feels good in the hands. And the little things like, you know, I can use the front and the back for bookmarks. But it's just yeah. really nice. Even the fact that they chose to put covers on that match the seasonal covers for the year. Yeah. That, it's yeah. really well done. So yeah, each each season is, is connected to the, each book is connected to the, the, the color we would the assume color. if we were following yeah. it in, in. And then Roberta Hansen, who's done a lot of design work for me, um, created these badges, these, oh, yeah. these lovely, she's a Winnipeg um, designer. Yeah, we, we, when it's we well did done. it, we said to them, it has to feel good. It, yeah. has, to, it has to be a pleasure to hold yeah. it. We just didn't want um, something that felt cheap. And they said, they said, they said we get that. Yeah, you know? and they yeah. did it well. Yeah, yeah they did. Absolutely. Okay, you in the introduction, you have the same introduction to each of the seven volumes. And in the introduction, yeah. you... You talk about the importance of story. Yeah. Um, you say stories matter. They matter to how we see, how we see and how we understand our world. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, because because really, what you're doing when you're telling the story of the church calendar years, you're telling the Christian story over of an arc of a year, um, and the, and in much the same way as a good story, a, a child will say, "Mommy, I want to hear it again," or "Daddy, I want to hear it again." There's something in us that wants to hear this again, and stories form who we are. Yeah. Um, and, and we often aren't really paying attention to the stories that we're paying attention to. I agree. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and as a result, we're being formed by um, forces that we don't necessarily, if we actually thought about it, mm -hmm. we would say are, have our best interests in mind. Yeah. And so when you think about storytelling, like even think about the television um, um, year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every year, twice, comes the Survivor series, right? And, and you can count on it. It's, it's, it's entertaining. It's, um, it's uh, for those of you that don't watch television, it's uh, kind of this, um, what do you call these kind of television shows? Um, reality reality TV, shows, yeah. yeah. But the basic story it tells is that there's, a, there's limited resources and there's too many people for that limited resource. Right. And so it's life is a blood sport in mm -hmm. a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the end, even relationships are strategy for winning. Right. They're, they're not really... Um, now, you tell yourself that story long enough, and that forms a certain kind of society, if that's true. Yeah. So if, if we live in a meaningless universe, and it's a blood sport in a zero-sum game, that's going to form a certain kind of people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think we're seeing that, <laughs> without, without saying yeah. more. Um, <laughs> but if that's not true, if, if it's a meaning-drenched universe... Um, created and sustained by an evergreen, abundant God, right. uh, that forms a different person, and that. And so, I, what I, I guess what I'm saying about this is, you know, we can choose the stories we tell, and the stories that are going to form us. And I, I've chosen this, and and I'm becoming a bit of an evangelist for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you say in that in that uh, introduction, you say that it's important. Well, hang on, I'll use your words. Um, you say, together these recurring seasons with their remembrances and fasts and feasts retell and reharrow. I love that word. Yeah. I don't think I've ever read that word anywhere. Reharrow the living story of God and God's good creation. That's beautiful. Mm. It's, it's mm. beautiful. You also use a quote right before each of the first chapters in the books. Mm -hmm. A quote from Joan Chittister, the Benedictine nun, yeah. right? What yeah. a great quote this is. Like a great water wheel, the liturgical year goes on relentlessly irrigating our soul, softening the ground of our hearts, nourishing the soil of our lives until the seed of the word of God itself begins to grow in us, comes to fruit in us, ripens us in the spiritual journey of a lifetime. I'm, I'm wondering, has that, has that been your experience? And I'm curious because your upbringing was Baptist yeah. and the Baptists and the Mennonite brethren yeah. aren't really well known for our clear following of the <laughs> Christian calendar. Well, we are, we are, but it's just truncated. Very I mean, much We all so. do Christmas every year. We all do Easter every year. Yeah. We probably do Holy Week and, and or Pentecost. Or pieces of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, and so it's just truncated. Um, and then the rest of the time is just sort of free time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's fine. I mean, that's, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that everybody has to follow this. Yeah. You know, that, that's not the point of it. But um, the church over time has basically filled in almost every day yep. with a saint or with a fast or a feast that is meant to sort of be part of that telling of the story. Yeah. And all of a sudden you realize that when you, when you divorce Christmas from Advent, you get Christmas Day. Yeah. Right. And look what's happened to Christmas Day. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you put it back in the in the larger season and the things that come after it, 
you know, so for example, the, the three days after Christmas or four days after Christmas is, is the feast of, of the holy, the death of the holy innocents. Yes, yeah. You know, and so all of a sudden you have this, all of a sudden this shocking, horrifying remembrance. Mm -hmm. um, but it tells you something that that this Christ, this 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 God who comes, and and to be with us is is immediately resisted by powers. Yeah. They immediately sense the threat to systems and and top down kind of yeah. power, and yeah. they and they push back. And if we remember these things, it takes away some of the sentimentality of what we've done with Christmas. You know, so if you put it back in context, mm -hmm. we don't have to save Christmas anymore. It's, it, it it's, tells it's, the right story. Right, right. Yeah. So, so when in your own personal spiritual pilgrimage did you begin to re rediscover or discover for the first time some of these riches? Well, it started young. My dad is a Baptist minister, um, but he was a, he was a Protestant um, chaplain at Stony Mountain Prison when I was a boy. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic priest at Stony Mountain was Father Bob McDougall. Right. And, and he, I loved this guy, and he loved me. We were, we were great friends. And, um, and he was also the parish priest in Stony Mountain, and they didn't have anybody to do music. And so when I was like 12, he came to my dad and said, can I ask Steve to come and do music at the Catholic Mass every Sunday? And so every Sunday I'd go down yeah. and do yeah. the music. I'd, this was all hocus pocus to me. We Baptists <laughs> didn't do all this bells and smell stuff, right? But, um, but what, I ha what ended up happening is I started noticing. I started, you know, um, yeah. and I started loving it. Mm -hmm. I started loving um, the movement, the arc mm -hmm. of the mass itself um, and waiting for key moments. I, I remember just waiting for that bell to ring right. or this right. to happen and, and somehow my soul would resonate. Mm -hmm. And then I started to notice the arc of the seasons a little bit. And then I kind of came away from that and then about... Nancy, how long ago was it we started? We were part of St. Benedict's starting. Is that over 10? 10 years ago? More? We were part of um, organizing um, and helping Jamie House and start St. Benedict's Table, right. the African thing. And so from that time on, I've, I've been immersed in right. this calendar year. And so it's become more and more. Before that, we were part of Green of Wheat Church, and Green of Wheat did that mm -hmm. um, as well. So it's just, it's been years. Yeah. Okay. Then, then this question. Most of the songs that you are using as illustrations here mm -hmm. um, are yours. There are others, Al yeah. Alana and Gord Johnson, and mm -hmm. there's a list of others, Jim Crogert and others. But most of them, when I look at them, are, are your writing. And a lot of them from oh, the last 20 years. Yeah. I'm guessing even before a project like this was a seed in, in your mind. Um, and, and yet, so many of your songs fit so well with the themes and the seasons of the church year. And so my question is, to what extent has this larger story of God, the, mm -hmm. the story we celebrate in the calendar, to what extent has that story always been shaping your music making? And were you always aware of it in the background? And I'm only asking this because so many songwriters I know, and I don't mean this negatively, but so many start with, their own personal stories. And yet right. there's this thread through your songs that's deeply rooted in the events of God's calendar. Is this subliminal for you? Yeah. Is this conscious? It wasn't conscious. No, I only noticed when I started writing, yeah. you know, so I'd write a blog on this part of the season, I think, oh, I got a song for that. Yeah, yeah. And so I'd, I'd add it on. And huh. then at, when it was kind of all done, I kind of realized how many yeah. did fit. But there was no, there was never any um, intention. That's interesting. There. Because I, I kept looking and seeing the same thing, saying, oh, I know that one. Oh, wow, that fits so beautifully with this season. Right, right. So it must, it must just be that, you know, I wrote that song at Epiphany Time, and that's, <laughs> that's what we were doing at church, you know, and so maybe, that, was, maybe. that was kind of... Because yeah, most of my songs, I, they're not that deliberate. They, I, I more receive them than push go after them, out. them. Yeah, or yeah. go after them, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the sources you drew on, the Christian thinkers, the theologians, the artists, the, where, where is the inspiration in this coming from? Well, a, a lot of it, um, I, I get a lot from Malcolm Geit, yeah. my, my English poet friend, yeah. who has just, like when I saw, he came out with a book of poetry called 70 Sonnets for the Church Calendar Year, I don't know, about half, half a decade ago or so, mm -hmm. and it staggered me. I, really? I, I suddenly saw not only um, sort of the logic of the arc, but the beauty of it. Mm. And all of a sudden, it was beyond now just straight. To, this is this is now becoming a, a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. In in his in his mouth. Yeah. Right. And so I think that was huge. Um, there's certain people. Um, uh, I, I read a lot of N.T. Wright um, mm. through this. I read a lot of um, like Alexander Schneeman, an Orthodox. Mm -hmm. um, 
Father Gabriel of um, Magdala wrote a book called Divine Intimacy, and it's a, sort mm-hmm. of a thick daily um, through the church calendar year, okay. but it's coming at it for, as, as a mystic. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not sort of a your devotional. Right. Like, he, he, he's just, he would find things that would just stagger you mm-hmm. day after day after day. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of quotes either from him or people he was quoting from. Right, right. You know, right. and if you want to write a, a decent book, just get good quotes because <laughs> <laughs> people will remember that. <laughs> it's a key thing, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, do you have a favorite season? Like if I forced you right now to say, I have to choose between the seven, where would you land? I, th- I think probably at this point, Advent. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, there's something about that sort of um, uh, tapping into that, that longing, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that soul that's longing to be filled. Yeah. You know, when you take that time, and the, the, the point about the Advent season is very, it's very maternal. It's sort of that longing for for new life with inside, yeah, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so it's a, it's a matter of waiting and, and, and I mean, I talk about this in, in the Advent thing yeah. that um, the, the problem with us in our day right now is we use Advent as pre-party for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. And then by the time we get there, we're already full and glutted and we've had too many visits and too many parties and Christmas Day just feels, and, and the week following just feels like a burden. Yeah. You know, traditionally Advent was a time of fasting and the idea was you've got a kid coming Right, you got to clear some space, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, metaphorically, you know, mm-hmm. and and so if you're a young couple and if you have a child coming, you got a two bedroom apartment, and the apartment is full of all your extra stuff, you got to decide what's, what's going to the garage go, or yeah. what's going to the storage and what you know because you got to make room. And so Advent in itself is a time of detaching, yeah. so that you can attach, yeah. right? And yes. so it was traditionally Advent was it felt more like Lent, yeah. yeah, like it felt although it wasn't penitential. It was just more logical. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm medicating myself with lesser fare. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I've got to sort of detach so that I can attach to the greater thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I like that. And so it's, it's not like I do it well. <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> right? But I like the idea. And every year I, I, I try again, and, but I find the, the effort to be meaningful. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think I would be in the same place as you. Yeah. Um, do you want to just say a word about the online resources that are attached to this? We haven't said anything about that. Right. Okay, so when, when, I, when I wrote it first online, if I had a song, I'd put the, the lyrics on, and then I could just have the song right there, and you could click on it and listen to it. Um, and with a book, of course, you can't do that. So uh, whenever at the end of a... Um, and most chapters, there's a song at the end, a lyric. And you can, you can either buy the CD... Mm-hmm. There's a double CD set that comes with, with uh, the music on it. Or, you can, for free, you can go online um, to um, pilgrimier.com right. and they're all there. Right? So you can just click on But if you want to listen to it in your car, yeah. you kind of got to buy the CD. But if you just want to do it at home with a headset, um, you don't have to buy the CDs at all. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, I think there's a couple videos too. Yeah, we've got a couple Advent videos season. of Malcolm Geist. Yeah. 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 A few times, again, if you haven't ever seen Malcolm, he's this English <laughs> poet and he is just so charming and wonderful. And you just point a, a camera at him and ask him any question in the world, and you'll get this astonishing thing. Yeah. So I asked him at one point, I says, why should we, why should we um, bother with the saints or remember the saints? You know? And he just goes, oh, well, you know. And then he goes this whole thing. He says, well, you know, you, I think of the saints. He says, there's only really two things you need to know about the saints. There's lots of them, and they're all on your side. Right, <laughs> you know, and then he, and, and you just got to see him do this, and then he talks about, and so there's thin aesthetic, you know, Francis, and there's portly Chesterton, and there's wine bibbing this guy, and there's joking that guy, and there's this woman, and he says, and the whole idea is you go into this neighborhood and find a friend, and and there's a neighborliness, neighborliness about the saints, and so in five minutes on this video. You, you just get this whole like it makes so much sense mm-hmm. and it's so wonderful. Yeah, it's beautiful, and and, and, and we just. I can't put that in the book, but it's on the site. It's, all, yeah. it's on the site, yeah. so you can go see it. It's yeah. worth seeing, I yeah. agree. Yeah, I watch that all the time, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, he can say just about anything. You get he that. can say anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a couple, couple last questions. Um, what are you hoping people will, will take away from their experience with this, from the stories and the songs and the poems and the prayers? What, what, what are you hoping they experience? I think in the modern era and the postmodern era and the post postmodern era, which mm-hmm. we're in now, I think I think really what we're seeing is that a lot of people have really lost confidence mm-hmm. in our scriptures, lost confidence in our tradition. 
Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and I don't have the, um, the, the scholarly or the intellectual capacity to, to be able to put that into words. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's something about the tradition I think is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm really kind of hoping is I can reanimate an, an intrigue and a trust in the tradition yeah. and then let the story do its work. You back away and let the story yeah. do its own work. Yeah. Right? So that's what I'm kind of hoping for. My, I have a, kind of a little bit of a mission statement, and that is to refresh um, uh, Christian faith and spiritual tradition for the weary and the wary. Mm -hmm. And that, I'm sure that fits pretty much everybody in this room and everybody you know, yeah. right? So I, I'm trying, the book isn't, it isn't scholarly. It's not saying this is the only interpretation. I'm certainly not saying anywhere near all that could be said because yeah. if I was doing that, it would be 30 books yeah. twice as big, yeah. right? But what I kind of hope I can do is sort of pique the, the, the intrigue, uh, you know, and hopefully through reading the, these books and entering into this, this, the stories and the music that, that it'll sort of give people, an, you know, I should, I should pay more attention yeah. to this yeah. and attend more, yeah. attend. Um, and I think attend is a word that we need to pay attention to. <laughs> attend to, yeah. 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 I think you succeed, I, I really do. Thank you. Uh, a project like this only really happens with the support of a large cast of characters. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just wondering, Who's been in this with you? Anybody you want to single out? I know this is always dangerous, but is there anyone you want to point to as being a real support, encouragement, the essential piece of this process? Oh, well, well Dave, my manager, mm. um, um, who's been with me for, uh, you know, I don't know, 300 years. And, and <laughs> we, I mean, we've, our whole sort of career has been together yeah. um, um, for this. And, and then Faye is here. She's worked with me for years. And Don Betts is here somewhere. And... Um, Amy Knight, who's on maternity leave, she did a lot of work on this. Yeah. Um, um, I would say my community of friends, um, uh, a lot are here. There are people here I've known for decades, yeah. you know, who have spoken to my life, who have read books with me, who have encouraged me, who have supported me, all that. Um, uh, I have a, a, a board of directors, you know, advisory board. Uh, Ren Martins is here. The rest are in other parts of the world. But really, really, I've had good counsel mm -hmm. and advice and... I mean, there's a lot, you know, and then there's Roberta who does the design, people that make it beautiful. And yeah. So yeah. yeah, it is, it, yeah, I, I wrote the words, right? But there's a lot that goes into it. A lot behind it, it. Yeah. okay. I'll just make a final comment and then we'll let you get on. Okay. Um, personally, I found this to be a, a very deeply meaningful collection. It was really a spiritual journey. Um, but as is very typical for you, Steve, I also found it to be grounded in real life and real experiences and real issues. And along the way, you managed to weave uh, in comments on a whole variety of social issues that are of concern to all of us right now. I started making a list as I was mm -hmm. reading, and, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but care for creation, the gift of indigenous voices, the presence of violence, Western capitalism, loneliness, grief, genocide, residential schools, addiction, adoption, aging, religious extremism, I could go on and on. Mm. Um, and, and you weave these things in with, with great personal vulnerability, mm. drawing on your own life stories and your own experiences. And, and so I, I really believe this is a tremendous gift to us, mm. uh, seeing this, this larger story of God through your eyes and your experiences and through your music as well. Mm. So um, on behalf of all of us, I thank you. And I wish uh, God's blessing on your continued ministry, on your family, on you as well. Thank you. Ah, oh, Christine, you're really good at this. I, I, I do a lot of interviews, you know, and I hate them because there's a good interviewer is pretty, um, well, like a good preacher or like a good anything. I mean, the, the really great things are, are not that common. Thank you. I appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> um, can you sit? I, well, I'm asking you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'll, I'll read a little bit, okay, of the book to you. Um, and, and I won't read too much. I kind of, the biggest stress I had was picking passages because I don't know what to do and how long. So, um, this first, I'll read two things. The first one is 45, 50 minutes. And then, um, <laughs> and the second one is not as long. Um, no, it isn't. I'll just, um, really short. Again, these, these, um, 
These chapters are, I mean, they started as blogs, so they're, they're kind of short. This is um, uh, chapter two of the Advent um, thing. Several years ago, just prior to beginning of Advent, I felt a sense of dread billowing within my spirit. I didn't have the energy to head back into another Christmas season with its relentless pressures and obligations. Nor did I have the fortitude to stomach the superficial religious platitudes and consequence and secular defenses associated with the culture wars surrounding the meaning of the season. Equally, knowing my lack of discipline and restraint, I was already feeling bloated with excess before the season even started. Too much food, too much drink, too much visiting, too many gifts. Something in me wanted desperately to distance myself from the excesses, but another part of me was still wanting something, longing for something, waiting for something. One morning, these words from Father John of Kronstadt's prayer journal, My Life in Christ, evoked tears. He says, My spirit still thirsts after understanding. My heart is still hungry. When will it be satisfied? When will I find full bliss? What is it that we're waiting for? What is this inconsolable longing that dogs our days? According to St. Paul, our longings are not always vice, but perhaps germane to creaturely existence. He says, creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly while we wait for adoption and redemption of our bodies. That's Romans 8. My father, a prison chaplain for most of his life, did a lot of work in addictions counseling. He and his colleagues came to understand that the drive behind most addictions was an acute longing for transcendence, for a profound and intimate connection to the holy, who is holy other, in short, for God. All of our strivings, appetite and desires, all of our ambitions, rituals and even friendships are, in some recessed way, fueled by an innate longing to return to the one who comes to us and who meets us in Christ. Nothing is wrong with these natural desires in themselves, any more than there is something wrong with our thirst for water or hunger for food. In fact, the very existence of hunger and thirst is the first reliable indicator that there may well be something like food and water to meet those needs. So too, with the myriad emotional and spiritual hungers that rob us of peace and leave us restless and agitated, the problem comes when we medicate those drives with false consolations that only increase the appetite and leave us unfulfilled. I'm learning, or trying to learn, what St. John of the Cross stated so succinctly regarding that which ultimately satisfies our souls. He says, not the goods of the earth, nor the goods of heaven, but only the honor and glory of God. It seems almost too good to be true that one could come to be so utterly enraptured by the honor and glory of God enough to banish all other hungers all other desire, and yet, anyone who's ever been in love knows the intensity of romantic love and how blissfully myopic, myopic a lover can be. Perhaps those sort of romances, short-lived as they often are, are still, like the taste of bread and wine on the tongue, foretastes of the kingdom of love, a heaven unequaled by any other bliss. Advent begins with focused attention to the agony of most of our profound longings, the task is to let the truth behind those longings rise to the surface before suppressing them with lesser fare. Because the longings themselves may be the first reliable indicators of the coming one who is our true fulfillment, satiation, and joy. Let's chapter one. <laughs> I'll read you one more, and then I'll sing you a song, and then we can eat stuff. <laughs> ready here. Okay. So that last chapter, and there's a song that I just wasn't going to do for you because I didn't practice it. <laughs> <laughs> And you can get it online for free. So, okay, let me, okay. So, in these different things, I, some some of the chapters are like that. We're sort of talking about um, um, sort of an essence of the season or whatever. And then some of them are very particular. So, um, here's a very particular chapter for Advent. 
Um, and it's uh, chapter three um, it, of a feast that falls on December 6th, which is the feast of St. Nicholas of Myra, otherwise known as Santa Claus, yes, which is December 6th. If we reclaim that, it solves a whole lot of other problems, right? You know, there is actually a time for Santa Claus. Uh, the church knows this. We just forgot it. Um, and, but his is such a great story. Um, so uh, at the beginning of, of this chapter, I say a little bit about saints and, and Malcolm and, and that kind of stuff. But then we get to, to St. Nicholas. This isn't long, but it's kind of, well, it's, well whatever. Uh, <laughs> Poor old St. Nick has endured some serious revision over the centuries. From his beginnings as the beloved Bishop of Myra and champion of the poor in the early 4th century, to the Coca-Cola-endorsing ruddy-faced elf of the 21st century, Nicholas's fame has been appropriated to, to ins, appropriated, <clears throat> Nicholas's fame has been appropriated to inspire sincere empathy in some and excessive consumption in others. In the fourth century, he was a living icon of Christ himself. In modern times, he's become the high priest of, of the almost ubiquitous consumer cult, which drives much of Western society. Little information is known about the historic Saint Nicholas. The legends surrounding him are many and often fantastical, but what we do know suggests that he was renowned for secret gift giving and that he had an uncommon compassion for children in an age when childhood was often grim. One legend that I connect with personally tells of a poor man with three daughters. Without a proper dowry, the daughters were destined for a desperate future sold into slavery as prostitutes. Wanting to shield the family from the indignity of public charity, Nicholas slipped three bags of gold into their home under the cover of night, effectively saving the three young women from a life of wretchedness in the sex trade. Historian, historian Adam English's remark that it's a surprising legend to come out of an era that had little concern for vulnerable poor, especially women, gives some historical plausibility to the legend. Right? In our day, Christians are again taking up the fight against poverty and slavery, especially as these things relate to the sex trade. Perhaps St. Nicholas of Myra might be um, a worthy spiritual patron of such causes. He clearly saw the link between chronic poverty and slavery and acted selflessly to interrupt the devastating consequences consequences of deprivation. But here's where the story gets personal for me. Ruby Lynn is a young woman who is dear to our family. She is of First Nations descent, Oji Cree, and bears deep scars of a cruel history of cultural genocide inflicted on North American host peoples by European settlers, who were often, ironically, escaping dispossession and marginalization in their own homelands. Her personal poverty, along with the pain of belonging to a socially marginalized people group, eventually contributed to a life of prostitution through most of her teen and adult, early adult years. I once asked her if she didn't perceive other options for her life path, and she spoke quite candidly. Please don't try to tell me I have, I have the same opportunities as your children, she said. No one wants to see a brown answering a job posting, and when I walk into an office with an application, I can usually tell within a second that I don't have a chance. It's a flicker in the eye followed by over-politeness that tips me off and I know I've wasted my time. We often think of slavery as something that happens elsewhere. Because of my work as a singer-songwriter, I've had the opportunity to travel to many developing countries, India, Bangladesh, Thailand, Ethiopia, and the Philippines. Each of these places, the sex slave trade was cruelly evident, but it has many forms here at home as well. A recent publication by Covenant House in New York reveals that human trafficking is a $9.8 billion industry in the United States and the FBI estimates that as many as 100,000 American kids are forced into prostitution every year. Many of these kids are homeless, and that makes them especially vulnerable to exploitation and manipulation. And I've come to understand that the cause of this pervasive issue is poverty and social alienation, coupled with the predatory behaviors of, of the more powerful. During Advent, those of us who claim the Christian story as our own and who hope to reclaim the true meaning of Christmas may want to redouble our efforts on behalf of the disenfranchised and vulnerable poor. Perhaps we might join hands with a still living legend, jolly old Saint Nick, to embody with our actions one of the great mysteries of the incarnation. Christ comes not only to us, but through us. Let me say that last bit again. Perhaps we might join hands with a still living legend, jolly old Saint Nick, to embody with our actions 
one of the great mysteries of the Incarnation. That is this. Christ not only comes to us, but through us. Here's a song. Christ has no body here but ours. No hands, no feet here on earth but ours. Ours the eyes through which he looks on this world with kindness. Ours are the hands through which he works. Ours are the feet on which he moves ours the voices through which he speaks to this world with kindness through our touch our smile our listening ear embodied in us Jesus is living here let us go now in spirit in into this world with kindness. We kind of didn't know whether we should do a Q&A or not, and I, 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 it's not like that kind of a book, I don't think. It's not, I'm not posing difficult or challenging things. So if anybody was really burning with a question, we can, I can take it, but I want to know which font we used. <laughs> um, Okay, um, the other thing is, is the, uh, uh, just for a little bit of um, uh, more info, the, the book series itself comes as a box set, uh, the seven books for, what, 50 bucks, Dave? For, oh, less than $50. <laughs> what a deal. Or if you're interested in just the single books, like you'd like to get just the Advent book, or you'd like to get 10 of them for your small group, or stocking stuffers, or something like that, um, they're, nine, they're under $10, uh, $9.99, and the CD is... Twenty-four ninety-nine, but that's a two-CD set. I think there's thirty-seven songs, and the, the CD set doesn't have every song referenced in the book because we couldn't pack them all on. But it's got almost all of them. So if you get to a song and it's not on there, it still is on the website. But most of them are on there. Yes. Am I going to write more books? I, I suspect. Yeah, I think I think so, um, but I'm not committed yet. I think I have to um, recover from this one. It was just hard work. I'm still a little tired of it, but I, th I think I probably will, yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All the songs, yeah, all the songs are collected from my body of work over the last 30 years. So if you got all my stuff, you got everything already, right? Right. We should have put one new one on there, so you had to buy the CD for the new one. <laughs> that was bad marketing on our standpoint. It's, it's the best of, yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, oh, the lullaby song, the first one I did? No, it's not in the book, but it's online at CompassionSeries.com, and you can download it there onto your computer and make copies from there. Yeah. 
I, I imagine it'll go on my next album, I assume, but that we won't start till next year. Anything else? Thank you very, very much for coming out, and um, I really appreciate it. And uh, um, I, I gotta say, uh, all my music friends from across um, North America, when I tell them what kind of support I have from this community, they can't believe it. Nobody, nobody does um, for their artists what Winnipeg does for their artists. And, uh, and I'm considered very lucky, and most of my friends are very jealous although they still say they don't want to live here, but <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I really do appreciate, and I, I see so many people here who I've known for decades, and I know many of you have um, invested in my work financially and emotionally and prayerfully and neighborly and, and all those kinds of things. And so I'm just very, very aware that, um, that I'm part of something, and, uh, and I'm grateful to be part of this. Thank you very much.